And if you talk to people who are in Sierra Leone, so my husband is in Sierra Leone right now and I'll be back in January, you know, they will just say like, yeah, things are okay and everything seems okay. But you only have to have an in-depth discussion to begin to understand how significantly they've had to modify their life. Um, I know certainly when I left Sierra Leone in August, for instance, we weren't shaking hands anymore. And that was the strangest thing. People have made significant changes um, to their lifestyles um, where uh, people, for instance, who were always kind of visiting each other, people would always just drop by without kind of the need for big appointments and things like that. All of that is changing significantly. I think even before I traveled, and it's even worse now, people were making a joke about the issue of shaking hands and abo avoiding body contact, but in the Western area they were responding. And um, I recall that in July, um, some colleagues went up country for a funeral of someone who had died in Freetown. And when they got to Kenema, they found that nobody was touching. They came back and commented about the different ways in which people greeted one another. Nobody was touching, even more than in Freetown. So I assume that by now in Freetown, nobody's touching people. Um, on the, when you speak to people, they will comment um, with concern at the fact that people don't visit each other as they used to. They don't visit around funerals at all. People don't attend funerals uh, to pay their last respects to people who have died. The economic activity has really, really slowed down, especially in Freetown. There are amongst professional uh, business people, lawyers, you hear a lot of complaints about um, lack of work. The courts are hardly functioning. So that is having an impact. The schools, of course, are closed, which causes a lot of problems, so problems within the homes. Um, so it's, I think it's maybe there's a lot of boredom and, and that's a, 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 um, a, an atmosphere in which a lot of rumors will proliferate. Well, let's take the school industry, for instance. So I, I, you know, I know a lot of people who own schools and who own daycare centers. Um, their businesses are effectively closed, the, all the industries. So I know someone, for instance, who runs a uniform business and supplies whole chains of schools. That's at a standstill. In the uh, Tonkolili district and in Potloka district, where you have the bulk of the mining activity, a lot of the mining activity has been suspended and that has had an impact on those communities, a substantial impact on those communities. I talked to my cousin not too long ago and I was saying, you know, like, how are things like in the market? Because there was a point in time some of the markets were shut down. They closed them down. They weren't, people weren't allowed to sell. And our markets are different than the markets in the West. It's, everything is kind of out in the open. Everything's very fresh, organic. So everything's raw, especially with the meats and fish and poultry and all of that. Everything is raw and it's very congested. The market that I used to go to is very congested. You are literally bumping and rubbing up against people. You know, so for a while, they shut all the markets down. And she was saying now that at, at one point there was like a black market. So it was like people were selling things even though they weren't supposed to. And she was like, what else are we supposed to do? How are we gonna eat? Because they told, because I remember I was in Liberia. They sent out a message saying that people should buy canned goods and packaged goods. The average Liberian doesn't even live off of $2 a day. How do you expect them to go to a grocery store and buy canned goods? It's, that's not a logical you know, suggestion where you have uh, the majority of the population living in poverty. So you, you need markets. That's how, how else are they going to eat? And so she's like, what else do they expect us to do? We can't go to a supermarket and buy canned beans. We need the fresh one. It's cheaper. And so they started out with the, like the underground black markets. And then now people are just like, this is not going to work. So they eventually opened the markets back up again. And she was like, yeah, the markets are back open. People are selling. She's like, well, we just, we just have to be very careful. She's like, it's hot, but you see people walking around in jackets and sweaters, you know, protecting themselves so that they don't, you know, rub up against people. If somebody has the virus, they don't want to get their sweat on them. You know, she's like, it, it's hot. And people are literally burning up going to the markets because they have on all of this protective clothing. She's like, but we have to do what we have to do 
we have to survive, we have to eat. So I was like, oh, just as long as you're being safe. <laughs> One of the first um, structures that was suspended were the periodic markets in the rural areas. Uh, the weekly markets, the lumas or doorways as they're called. And that hit uh, people very hard, especially the women. Then the closures of the borders eventually affected uh, cross-border trade for many of the women in the organizations that I am part of and work with. Um, it has had some impact on farming because people have, are not necessarily able to get people to come and help them on their farms. I, I think that in the planting season, there are groups of people who move around the country, young people who are working on farms. And with the quarantine, that has had an impact on that movement around the country to do farming. The markets are working, so um, I mean, there may be shortages, so you may not get exactly what you want to eat every day, but you'll get something to eat. It's more expensive. And of course, then, you know, for poorer people, that affects them a lot more because maybe it's, you know, the prices are not doubled or anything, but they're significant enough for people to, you know, be, be having significantly poorer and less uh, quality meals. And we already have a huge problem with malnutrition in Sierra Leone. And so for this to add to it, that's just, you know, um, raising the bar of the problems that we'll have to deal with after. The other thing is that a lot of farmers, because of the quarantines, are not able to shift their food. So all of these foods, you know, are rotting in the fields while um, people are actually hungry and there's nothing, there's not enough in the markets.